Welcome to the Graybeard Chronicles podcast. Your hosts, Brian Halstead and Kevin Harkins, are two gray-bearded patriots who love God, their family and friends, and their country. The Graybeards are here to inspire, inform, and educate you on a myriad of topics they are passionate about. Brian and Kevin have a strong desire to share this with you to help you live your best life. Sit back and enjoy this amazing podcast as the Greybeards pass along the wisdom of the ages. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Greybeard Chronicles. I'm Brian Halstead. And I'm Kevin Harkins. And Kevin, we're here to pass along some wisdom of the ages. What the heck does that mean? We're not perfect, but we do have gray beards. And that means we've got some significant life experience some life lessons, and some perspectives that are worthy of passing along. Well, I think that sums it up nicely. Let's get to it. Kevin, what's going on, buddy? Good evening, Bryant. Hey, I, I don't know that I've ever, I've ever actually said this out loud. I think it every time I listen to it. That chick on the recording there on the intro, she sounds hot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Turns out um, that doesn't surprise me that yeah. you think that. Yeah. I, I need to get, get to know her better. Yeah. Yeah, you should. <laughs> So how the heck are you, man? You doing all right? I, I love technology. You know why? Why? This whole pandemic, there's been a lot of bad and uncomfortable and difficult that's come out of it, but there's been some good things. And we are sitting here with an amazing guest who might as well be sitting right next to us. And I'm thrilled about that. And uh, that's why I love technology. So David Bush, we are so glad that you are here. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight on the podcast or, or, you know, whenever somebody happens to listen to it, it might not be night, but, um, I'm going to take a few, few minutes or maybe just a minute to introduce you to our guests. And, uh, we are excited to chat with you about, um, well, a whole bunch of stuff in your life. And the thing that I, uh, so Brian and I met David Bush, um, Dave is fine, right? We can call you Dave. Um, hey, call me anything. Just don't call me late for dinner, right? <laughs> <laughs> How long ago was it? A couple years ago now? Is it or maybe has it been ago? that long? I think it has been. It's uh, it's been a minute. We were uh, we were out in California at uh, a mindset science uh, conference. Uh, yes, by California you mean Las Vegas. I'm sorry, Las Vegas. Yeah, that's right. Sorry about that. Wow, it's all good. It's all it's all sort of one big get, blur. I know you're getting old, buddy. Sorry. Yeah. I, I got you, man. I got you. Mindset Science, <laughs> Gerhard Schwantner. Uh, give a shout out to him because we met a whole bunch of cool people at that place, and and Dave was one of them. Um, anyway, Dave has had a miraculous life, and I want to talk about it. First of all, just with, with some of the basic stuff. Dave is a certified health and lifestyle coach. He's a business coach. He's a motiva mo motivational speaker. He's the owner of Extraordinary Health Coaching. He uh, is a former... A football player at a very high level, professional level, played at University of South Dakota, currently uh, focuses on helping anybody who's willing to listen to him improve their body, improve their mind, improve their finances. Uh, he played pro football for the Iowa Barnstormers in the Arena Football League. And if you guys uh, out there listening haven't watched Arena Football League, you talk about a fast-paced hot mess. I mean, there's a lot going on on that football field. And to me, what is equally as interesting as the fact that you played it, Dave, it's, it's your journey to get there. That is remarkable. Also, I wanted to make sure that I said that uh, Dave has a brand new book out. You see it sitting right here. It's called Live an Extraordinary Life, Six Commitments to Live Your Dreams and Change Your World. And I love that subtitle, actually. The title is great, but the subtitle, because it doesn't mess around. This is about commitment, making the decision that you're going to do it to live your dreams and change the world. Yeah, don't worry. There'll be a link down in the uh, in the notes on, on where you can get this book right near right there next to the subscribe button. So, you know, just click on them both while you're there. Dave, we are honored. Welcome. Welcome to hey. our set. We're thrilled to have you. Yeah, man. Good to see you hey, again. guys. Thanks so much for having me. It's always great to spend time with uh, like minds, uh, guys that think big, dream big, and and do big things in their life. And so I'm so excited to get a chance to be here with you all and, you know, share some of the things that uh, I've learned through the years of how to live an extraordinary life and 
just you know give people more hope and more encouragement maybe some motivation to challenge themselves to do something extraordinary uh, in 2022 or whenever they're listening to this uh, because I think that each and every one of us have some extraordinary futures up ahead of us. All it takes is just us being willing to embrace it and to uh, to clarify it. So super excited to be around you guys. And uh, I knew uh, from the time that we were on that golf course and in, uh, in beautiful, uh, I think it was Northern California, isn't it Las Vegas North or South? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Yeah, yes. but, uh, I think, my, I think I actually, to be precise, it was somewhere near Henderson, Nevada, I believe, wasn't it? That's right. No, yeah. it was Northern California, Nevada. <laughs> Uh, yeah. well, I think that I think that most of most of the balls that I hit on the golf course that day were somewhere downtown in Las Vegas. They weren't anywhere near Henderson, uh, <laughs> Hendersonville. But uh, yeah, it was so much fun just uh, hanging out with you guys, spending some time you know, thinking more about how we can expand our potential and how we can Im impact other people's lives. And you guys are doing such a great job with this podcast. And I know you guys have a lot of fun doing it, uh, but I think you're bringing a lot of value to the marketplace and uh, and it takes time and effort and an investment. And I just honor the fact that you guys are doing it and you continue to do it on a regular basis. So kudos to you guys. Thank, Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Very kind. You know, Thanks for not critiquing our golf yeah. game too much. Kevin, Kevin was pretty stellar that day. Mine was, uh, you talk about yours being bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually remember a quote from that day. Uh, very well and it came from you dave uh as we were golfing i think when we finished up and people were the people that were with us but not in our foursome or threesome was somebody else with us i don't remember anyway i remember the conversation then i remembered at the end somebody said how'd you guys do and dave you said kevin put on a golf clinic exactly I that's exactly <laughs> what happened and you know why i remember that because anytime a pro professional athlete is going to tell me that I did something well uh, that was somewhat athletic, I'll take it all day. So, yeah, thank you for saying that. I'm sure you have no idea, but to me, it was a big deal when you said that. We, Dude, talked we about had a lot of fun. That's what on. <laughs> Here's my first question I want to ask you, Dave. And uh, so one of the interesting things that we got a chance to talk a lot about, which our listening audience will hear about for the first time, is that when you played in the Arena Football League, you were actually the center for the now Super Bowl champion and Hall of Fame quarterback, Kurt Warner. And uh, that was fun to listen to those stories and, and you know him well, and he's a friend of yours. What did, what did you teach him about football? That's, that's my first question. What did I teach him about football? Well, I think that a lot of people will say that, you know, um, had it uh, not been for arena football, he wouldn't have such a quick release. Right. But what I tell people is that had it not been for my poor blocking, <laughs> he, would have, he would have had a late release. He had to but, move. You know, my my, my uh, usual thing was, just, you know, I, I tell people as I was an ordinary football player playing at an extraordinary level uh, because I, I did extraordinary things to get there. Um, but there was a lot of guys that were bigger, faster, stronger than I was that deserved to be at a much higher level than arena football who were – really hard to handle. Uh, I think that every every uh, man or woman reaches a level in their life where they, they match up with somebody that is significantly better than them. And there were some times that I was, you know, in the huddle with Kurt going, you know, I was the offensive center and I'm kind of like, hey, can we go on to please, please help this guy jump off sides because it, he is a load to handle. So there were definitely a lot of times when I was uh, taking on a guy that was bigger, faster, stronger, that I was given the old lookout block, like, you know, hike the ball and say, look out, throw it, you know, get rid of it. That's right. <laughs> so he's better because of evolution. He had to survive. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, survival of the fittest. <laughs> yeah, right. they said that, you know, he was such a good, a good job of, uh, they called him Houdini back in the day because he wasn't really uh, the most agile and speedster of a quarterback, but somehow he just avoided the uh, the tacklers and got rid of the ball and to him i say thank you because if he would have been sacked i would have been uh, sacked out of the arena league a lot earlier but yeah you know kurt uh, you know obviously we taught a lot to each other you know there's a whole, you get to become pretty close friends when another grown man has his hand between your legs uh you know it's you want to get to the point where you um you know get to know the guy fairly well and i and i tell people all the time you know there's there's one thing that people don't know about Kurt Warner, and, and I would say that he probably has some of the coldest hands I have ever felt between uh, my legs. But oh. uh, he, uh, he, awesome. a shotgun, 
shotgun. But yeah, my uh, my relationship with Kurt really has uh, been one of the, the highlights of my life. Just to see, you know, a, a close friend who I mean, the movie that he just released, American Underdog, is out, and many people have seen it. And it is truly a very accurate depiction of the events that I experienced right alongside of them. Um, you know, being involved in that whole process of um, the hardships and the challenges. And, you know, he wasn't the best quarterback. We actually had another guy that actually uh, was competing with him at quarterback. So the chances of him going to the NFL, being the NFL MVP, winning a Super Bowl, going to two more Super Bowls, and getting into the Hall of Fame after only playing for 12 years in the NFL, it's truly extraordinary. And it's that's why I had him write the uh, the, the uh, introduction or a little endorsement on my book because his story is a big part of my story. Outstanding. And you are you are clearly an, ex, an experienced interviewee getting that out of the way right away. You just take the whole, you know, some other man's hand between your legs. <laughs> that way, it's, it's a we, great story. Yeah, we, we can't yeah. jump on it because you already took care of it. So that, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. You know, the thing that, uh, that I like about uh, this whole story, your story, uh, is that, you know, you can have all these people in life that you sort of bump into and, you, and then you, you move away from each other never to see or hear from them again. That wasn't the case with you and Kurt Warner and many other, other of your close football friends. But this is what I know about life. Good people tend to hang around with good people. So the fact that I know you're a good guy and I, you know, I can, I don't know Kurt Warner at all and then never met him, but he just seems like such a classy guy as well. And you guys match. And mm -hmm. so it's, uh, it's neat to see that, um, you know, unfold in, in that kind of way. And it's neat that uh, you guys stay in touch. So that's very cool. Talk about this for a minute. What what caused you to want to uh, to to go from coaching these concepts and these commitments and these principles to people to actually put it down in writing and and you know and then I actually do want to come back to your journey about how you start playing pro yeah. football. But let's stick with this first. Yeah, probably uh, mostly exhaustion uh, and just continuing to tell people the same concepts over and over and over again, and then seeing the impact of the concepts when applied. And yeah. what they could accomplish and you know i, th I think as we um as we age and we grow those beards I actually if i grew it it would be gray okay um, but uh, i think that you know we we want to pass on a legacy we want to pass on some um perspective um you know first and foremost for my family and for my friends i, I wanted them to I put off writing a book for many years just because I felt like that there was so many other great books that had already been written on the concept. And I, I ran into a guy that uh, worked with authors to help them to publish their book. And one of the things he said to me really stood out. And he said, David, there's a lot of other books maybe on this same topic, but none of them are yours. And what you bring to the story or what you bring to the topic is your stories. And people will be inspired by your stories where they may not be inspired by other people's stories. So really what the book was, was it was my story. And I think that each and every one of us has a story inside of us. You guys are using the podcast to deliver your stories and you guys have some great ones. <laughs> um, but, you know, the idea of creating a book and a, a life planner was kind of like my way of um systematizing if that's such a word um, or making a systematic approach to the concept of designing and living an extraordinary life and i think that each and every one of us can do that that's kind of what i talk about in the book is that many people think about extraordinary uh, living as being opulent wealth power privilege and all the things that they may not have but that's not the angle that i take the extraordinary life that i talk about is helping people to go above and beyond what's usual, regular, and customary, which is the definition of extraordinary in Merriam-Webster's dictionary. And what I try to tell them is, is that um, it's kind of like a mountain to climb. And I, I give them this analogy of five different areas of the mountain. You know, the cliff climber that's chasing new adventures, that's pursuing new goals, pursuing new dreams, and you know, going through the sacrifice and the cost and the investment and the failures but is truly living an extraordinary life. And they're going to have a lot of success and significance because they're continuing to climb. And then there's the people that are the comfort cave campers that are just hanging out at the comfort cave level where they've had some success, but they've kind of been resting on their uh, laurels, if you will. They're kind of 
enjoying the uh, kind of the conveniences of what their success has brought them, but they haven't really found a new mountain to climb or a new cliff to climb or a new peak to summit. And then there's the valley dwellers, the valley of complacency where people are just, you know, unaware of the dangers of complacency. And then there's the people that are rafting the river of an ordinary life, just going with the flow. And we all know there's so many of them. We have been them or we are them right now. We're just yeah. kind of going with the flow. And then there's the waterfall, which is the waterfall of an ordinary life. And that's when people oftentimes have the symptoms, the side effects, the consequences, the regrets of living an ordinary life. And sometimes that's too late. They can't climb the cliff or because of their, their physical ailments or because of their mental uh, uh, challenges or barriers, they just don't have the fortitude to get out there and climb that mountain. But it's been my life journey. I've shared it with so many people and I've seen the influence of what it's done for people. They just took similar commitments that I did and they committed to applying them to their life and they were able to summit their own extraordinary life mountain. So super excited to talk about it because it's really something that I believe is, is something many people need to hear, especially right now with everything we've been going on in the world. I think a lot of people have lost hope. I think that they're kind of rafting the river or they're you know, taking shelter in the comfort cave. They're not going after new dreams and goals. And that's my opportunity to challenge them. Yeah, and I, I said earlier, I, I don't know if I said this after we started recording, but uh, love the format, love the way this book is put together. Uh, the stories are great. And, uh, you know, you can you can see, at least I could, reading, you know, you kind of feel yourself in those situations. And um, it's very tactical in nature too, right? So easy to follow, thought-provoking, and uh, it, it's a it's a step-by-step -step how to guide and uh, i really like the way that you put that together man kudos to you thanks bryant and you know being a kid that didn't go to didn't go to school to play school you know i went to school to play football <laughs> i just had to be eligible so i had to get through the classes it was a real journey um, and it was one of my extraordinary dreams to write a book even though i wasn't in my mind a good writer i wasn't good with english i mean you know, I, I still have a hard time with math. You know, I'm just not a guy that really is a, a guy that's brilliant academically, but I've been able to take some ordinary skills and turn them into something that has some extraordinary value because I was willing to take a risk. And that just, if, that, if that's anything, if a person's out there and you have a story to tell, take the step, you know, start writing about it. Tell it you'd be amazed yeah. where it goes. Yeah, and I one of the questions I wanted to ask you is those different stages that you describe. Um, and I think you kind of alluded to this a little bit in the description of it is, you know, do you see folks or maybe you've experienced in your own life where you're at different levels? You know, you you may spend six, eight, 10, 12 months at uh, that extraordinary, you know, cliff climbing level. Um, and then, you know, you might experience some burnout or something and, and kind of uh, slide your way back down to a, a more comfortable level and maybe recharge. Have you seen that? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of it, I think, for a lot of us is that, um, you know, we often, like if they said back in the early days of when people went to the moon, you know, once the astronauts went to the moon, many of them came home and became alcoholics and became uh, pretty much um, recluse where they weren't really pursuing other things in their life because they had achieved the pinnacle of the space right. race, right? Yeah, what, what do you do moon. now? Yeah. What do you do now, right? I mean... Uh, there's a great, uh, great comedian named Brian Regan that says, you know, uh, he talks about walking on the moon as being the ultimate trump card in private conversation. It's like anything that a person could say, you could say, well, I walked on the moon and you could trump everybody. Well, these guys literally walked on the moon and what else was next? You know, they didn't have anything in place back there to help them to define a new calling, to define, to define what their calling was beyond their dream of accomplishment. Um, you know, I had one, one guy told me one time, or he asked me a question, and this is a question I'll pose to the audience, is that, are you more successful than you are significant? That's a, that's a hard question to answer, especially when you've had a lot of success in your life. You know, many of the gray bearded uh, folks that may be listening, or even the ones that don't have a gray beard, they're probably achieving some level of success, and they're looking at that next level of success. But what about the next level of significance? You know, does your life matter? Do you feel fulfilled? Do you feel purpose driven? And many people would not be able to say that, you know, they have that level of fulfillment that they could say, I, you know, I could go to the grave without regrets. And that's one of the things I put in the first chapter of the book was 
this um, hospice nurse, Bronnie Ware, she ended up interviewing all these different people that were in their final days of life. And the regrets were things that were not super hard to accomplish. It was like, spend more time keeping in touch with friends, mm. spend more time with my family, you know, tell people that what I really felt, what I wanted to do versus, you know, living somebody else's extraordinary life and not loving it. Um, there were so many just simple things that people could have done if they would have had the commitments or they would have taken these steps. And, you know, I'm happy to review the commitments in the book if that interests anybody, but yeah, that's really uh, good. Definitely, it does, definitely yeah. would love to have you go through those. Um, I will say this, though. Um, one of the things that, uh, that jumped out at me is, you know, the whole significance piece. And, and we've talked about this. Um, there's studies out there that say significance is the most important need that men have in, in their lives where, you know, women, that same study talks about safety and security, but for men, it's, it's significance. So that's, uh, that's really cool that you call that out. Yeah, I do this little analogy of, you know, this rubber band is kind of like the circle of life, right? And, you know, we go through this circle of life. Well, if you break it in half, it turns into a dash. And if you were to take the folks today, you know, if you were to think about the average age, right? I mean, if if one side is birth and the other side is death, you know, we could probably take this thing right in our hands and we could probably say, half of it's done. And you probably say, if we're not living, you know, healthy habits, we could probably trim off the last 10 years to not necessarily be a lot of time and effort and energy following our dreams. We're probably just surviving at that point. So really we have this little piece of life in our dash left and uh, hope I don't need that rubber band for anything, but um, you get the gist of it. It's, you know, our dash is, is limited. And, you know, if you're going to take your kids camping or you're going to take your grandkids camping once a year and they're five, you don't have a you whole bunch of times time. left, Yeah, you know, like you better get on with it. You better put a plan to it. You better put a deadline to it. You better focus on it. You better organize your life around it or otherwise you're not going to get to it. And you're going to be thinking, man, I wish I would have known my grandkids better. I wish I would have known my kids better. And that's pretty much the context of everything that I put into the book. It's not like some, you know, special juice where if you, you know, drink it, it's going to make you live an extraordinary life. Or if you hum it, it's going to give, it's none of that weird stuff. It's just like, it's not magic. It's not hocus pocus. It's focus, focus. And it's just about getting focused on what matters most to you. Yeah. I love the whole idea of the, the dash. You know, I've, I've heard that uh, used for years in, in the personal development arena um and uh it, it's interesting how you know it's been out there for a long time and then somebody will come in and do something different to it um dakota meyer uh marine veteran medal of honor recipient he uh he's actually trademarked the phrase own the dash um and and does you know a lot of training and development and so on based on that whole philosophy and idea of you know making making sure that you're leaving your mark doing doing worthwhile things while you're you know traversing along that dash yeah um over to summarizing kind of the key concepts the key commitments um you have a very handy mental handle that you uh, have put into an acronym which i don't even remember if it's spelled out in the book is it not it's spelled out in the book is it in the friday because if it if it is anyway you know what i'm talking about yeah. could you use that to um to talk you about bet. it yeah, so there's uh, six commitments and each one of the commitments is a chapter in the book. And I tried to figure out, you know, what would be the best way for people to remember these commitments. And so I thought, you know, an acronym would be probably helpful. Uh, I know it is for me. And so the acronym is LEADER and it stands for, the L stands for live your calling. And to summarize, your calling can be a lot of different things. Most people have either been called you know, from a spiritual sense to do something or to be something or to have something. Um, you know, I, I felt called to write a book. I didn't feel like it was just my dream to write a book. I felt called, like I had something to tell people. And there, there was an urging um, spiritually to, to write this out. Um, and then, you know, the E is engage in your dreams. Um, you know, living a person's calling 
oftentimes takes time to identify, you know, who's the group of people that you want to serve. You know, for you guys, you know, doing the Gray Beard Bearded Chronicles, you're you're really working with a specific niche group of men or women. I imagine you have some women listeners, but mostly your niche is men that are, you know, in that um, second half of life that are really thinking about how to live an extraordinary life or how to live a better life and to embrace the, the wonderful things that are going on in our world. Um, but oftentimes people lack the ability to dream. Les Brown once said that, you know, the average American dies at the age of 40. They just don't bury him until the age of 84 because he talks about people's dreams dying at the age of 40 and people being um, volunteered incarceration. You know, they're incarcerated by their job, their house, their bills, and they just can't do a lot of the stuff that they really want to do because there's obligations attached to it. So people stop dreaming about doing things. But you can dream. And when you dream, they say that when the dream is big enough, the facts don't count. And that's what I have found in my own life is when you have dreams and you engage in them. And what I talk about in the book is engaging in them is not necessarily doing all of them. It's spending time with them. So looking at them, dreaming about them, having a vision yeah. board or things yeah. like that. Those are the things that really make a big difference for people. And then the other parts of the, the acronym is agree to make hard choices, to decide uh, to fail your way forward. People oftentimes don't decide to fail their way forward because they think failure is the worst thing that could happen. And it's actually the best thing that could happen if you use it correctly and you never get to success without failure. So when people start to see it as a bridge rather than as a um, identity, they'll start oftentimes be willing to take the risks and take the chances and find success. And then the last two is to um, expand your perspective. I think many, many people, it's like Mark Twain once said, it's, you know, it's not what you know that gets us into trouble. It's all the things you know that just aren't so. And I think there's a <laughs> lot of right. that right. In, the, in the coaching world. I mean, you guys have experienced it just as, you know, guys that have been through life. You know, there were things that you were convinced of that it was supposed to go this way. And then you saw it work a different way and you thought, I didn't believe it could work that way. I didn't even know that I didn't know that. And so being willing to listen to other people's opinions, seeking counsel, having a coach, having a trainer, those type of things can end up helping you to see things that you don't see. And if you've ever watched any of the documentaries on climbing Mount Everest, most people don't climb Mount Everest on their own. They climb it with a person that knows Mount Everest better than they do. And then the last one is just to resolve to achieve your goals. And I think that there's been a lot of people that have set goals, set resolutions. They've done some of this other stuff, but they've never really resolved. Like they've never put their vote of competence to say, no, I'm going to do this. It's not a matter of um, will I do it? I am going to do it. I don't necessarily know what day I'm going to do it. I have a deadline, but if I don't meet the deadline, I'm still going to do it and I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to die on this mountain. Jim Rohn once said, you know, uh, better to die on the mountain than to be in the valley wondering if you could have climbed the mountain. Yeah. And that's the way I appro approach life is climbing the mountain, whatever that may be, the dreams, the calling, going after big things. I'm going to die on the mountain chasing another dream. My kids are going to see me going after something significant, and that's going to hopefully cast a shadow beyond the grave. I like it. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's important to to set those examples for your kids. And uh, one of the things that you talk about in the book is um, your parents and and you know their lifestyle and as small business owners and and the things that they did with personal development and you know that that's imprinted on you at a very early age, and yeah. that's that's cool stuff. And yeah, you wonder uh, what your kids would say about your life if it all ended today. You know, if yeah. they were to, if an interviewer or a reporter were to come to the kids and grandkids, say, describe your father, describe your grandfather. What did you know about him? What was important to him? Yeah. What did he, what did he believe in? What did he not believe in? You know, I mean, just to hear their answers to those questions would be, I think, very informative to us because, you know, we oftentimes, you know, we, we don't necessarily communicate as men as well as we should to our kids or our grandkids. So writing things down like a book was something for me to be able to give to my daughters and give to my son and say, this is what I believe. And, uh, and this is what I believe for you. And uh, I, I also did this thing with my dad that was really an enlightening. It was called, a, I think the book was called, 
a hundred questions to ask your father. It's a great okay. thing to go through before you die. Okay. Because you ask questions of your dad that you never knew. And because you have a little format that asks the questions, it's kind of a conversation guide. Um, and I didn't, my dad and I weren't very close growing up. I mean, he loved me and provided for me, but I didn't converse a lot with him. He was a hard worker. And uh, my brother had more in common with him than I did. And so sitting down to have that conversation um, really helped me to enlighten me to what mattered to him. And a lot of the things that mattered to him now matter to me because we had that conversation. That's very cool. Very cool. Along those same lines, uh, and I, I won't remember, I can't remember the guy that does this exercise, but uh, one of my close friends, my club brothers, um, and regular listener of, of the podcast talks about this exercise that this gentleman has people do that are his friends uh, or family members or, you know, he's like, why in particular, I think he talks about friends and, and having this conversation with your friends is ask them the question, why are we friends? You know, what is it about me that, mm -hmm. uh, that causes you to want to be friends with me? And, you know, you can just keep digging and you can ultimately, you know, you start, uh, querying enough people, you know, you'll end up finding a theme in there about the value that you bring to those other people in their lives. It's pretty cool. Yeah, we can yeah. we can also think too much about what other people think too, and I've I've been a, 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 a victim of that. Yeah. Uh, I've yeah. basically gotten my thoughts about you know what are people going to think if I do this and fail or what, and I love the uh, the phrase that says you know if it's uh, raining on the day of your funeral half of the people will show up. You know, there's a lot of people that really won't uh, be too inspired to go to your funeral if there's bad weather. So I wouldn't be too concerned about whether or not they're gonna think about, you know, you in a certain way, if you go after a dream or, you know, live your calling. It's funny, my, along that line, my father had a quote that he would say all the time, when something big happens in life, good, bad, or ugly in your life, he would say, people will care about this for about 15 minutes and then it's over. It's really true. I mean, you yeah. can, you know, Brian and I have talked about it probably a hundred times on the podcast of allowing external forces that are out there to dictate your life, to decide what you're going to do because you're so concerned about what people think about you or what they might say or all those things. And that's, that's craziness. Oh. Yeah. I heard a, a quote the other day. It said, uh, some people will sink your ship because they can't believe in captaining their own. Yeah. There you go. You can think about that. I mean, think about yeah. How many ships have been sunk by friends or family members or you know somebody else that had a dream or had a mission or a calling that was exciting and challenging and awe-inspiring but somebody came along and blew a hole in the boat and sank the ship just because they couldn't believe it for themselves and right. they could right. never have thought about the idea of sailing yeah um, so that's another thing about expanding your perspective is just looking at the people that you spend the most time with and identifying are these people taking me to where I want to go? Parents will do it. Parents will do it to their children, unknowingly, oh, yeah. right? So I, they would never set out to do that with intention, I don't think, right? Yeah. And they do it to their children all the time. They're, 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 uh, you know, they're, they're killing their dreams because they can't see themselves doing it, right? Um, that's a, sometimes I think parents do it with intention. May, yeah, maybe not not out of spite, but but more out of they think they're right. And, uh, right. and so it's just a mistaken thing that they do. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think I could, I could say that I've, I've been guilty of, of that as well is that, you know, and looking out for not wanting your children to fail, um, right. because right. failure is expensive and failure can be challenging. Not everybody responds well to failure. Some people, you know, turn failure into failure the rest of their life. Some people turn failure into a lesson and then turn it into success and significance. And because they failed, they now succeed. But um, yeah, we could be concerned for other people. And that's why it's good to have a, a plurality of counselors and, and coaches and other people so you can bounce ideas. If everybody's telling you not to do something, there may be a, a lining in that. It's something you should research before you go, you know what? Nope, everybody's trying to burn my ship down. I just got to go out there and sail away. Be careful of that. Yeah. I wanted to share with you just, and this won't take long, but, uh, you know, when I read the book, I was taking notes uh, throughout and just a couple of the highlights for me that, that hit me and resonated with me in the place that I'm at in my head right now as a, as a form of feedback to you. First of all, it's just full of amazing quotes. You know, 
there's so many good, relevant, thought-provoking quotes that are throughout the book that you won't ever get tired of it. The concept that at the right time, even a small change that you make in your life can be exactly what you need to keep yourself going. Because when you get um, when you get to the point where, oh, I got to make some sort of big change, you can be very discouraged and just want to stop. Make a small change. Um, so I took that away. Here's the best quote out of the whole book. This is the one for me. One hour of planning is worth eight hours of hard labor. I love that quote. And it's so true. And it just hit me right where I'm at. Um, Keep going even after major and or even embarrassing failures. You talked about it earlier, Dave, that you do something big and bad and nasty. And you said in your fail for fail forward chapter um, that it becomes a bridge. Don't let it become an identity. Have it become a bridge. Yeah. And that's exactly right. The go all in thing. I like that it's it's a quick read, but it's very thought provoking and very tactical to use Bryant's word. Uh, it's just it's just a great book, and uh, thank you for writing it. It's, yeah, no know. doubt. Love the checklist, right? So the the question about you know what things do you want to do in your life, and that whole you know kind of a dream inventory, and uh, how you list out all these activities, and I and I think in in uh, you know it causes you to think about things you maybe haven't thought about before, and and it also at the same time. Um, I found it somewhat reaffirming that, uh, you know, I, I'm living by that old adage that you, uh, you don't want to arrive at the grave in a, you know, well-preserved body that hasn't seen a whole lot of trials and tribulation and activities and so on. You want to slide into that bad boy, you know, smoke flying and, and you know, screaming, yee what a ride. Um, and, yeah, you, you start checking stuff off of that list. And uh, that's what it's about. It's about living, you know, to your point in the, um, you know, guys dying at, at 40 and not getting buried till they're 84. Um, yeah, look at, look at that list. Get this book, look at the list and see the things on that list that you've thought about doing and you haven't done. Um, get after them, man. Well, get, get to it. Let's get to it. <laughs> yeah, even just one, you know, uh, begins to give you that awakening. And, you know, I, uh, the, the chapter three is agree to make hard choices. And so one of the things that I've gotten comfortable saying, you know, I'm almost 50, I turned 49 this year. So a little younger than you guys, maybe. Uh, but I ended up uh, agreeing to kind of doing hard things. Just when, when somebody would say, well, that's hard. I'd say, well, that's perfect for me because I do hard things. I just do hard things. So anytime I think about something that's hard, I'm already in my mind thinking that's exactly what I do. That's a, if yeah. it's hard, I yeah. should be doing it. And so um, I set a goal to you know run a half marathon this last year. I'm not a runner. I do not enjoy running. It's not <laughs> something that I like to do for fun. But there's something that's about um, that makes you feel alive is when you're about to die. <laughs> like running a half marathon, oh. my my calves were firing. Like I was, they were going to cramp up bad. Um, I, I pushed myself to a place that, I mean, I didn't do a lot of training for it. I just signed up for the thing and said I was going to do it and started doing a little bit of training, not realizing how hard it would really be. I mean, running 13 and whatever miles it is, uh, it was it was a significant challenge. But there's something in the accomplishment of reaching a new summit that proves to you what you're capable of. So like when we were in Vegas, and I think you guys drove those race cars or drove those Lamborghinis yeah. and Ferraris and whatnot, yeah. you know, there was a new level of experience to do that. And every one of those dreams, whether it's to go to a baseball game in every baseball diamond in the country, or whether it's to, you know, uh, go watch the Olympics someplace, um, you know, all this stuff can lead to an experience that makes you feel alive. And I think that many people are just existing in life. They don't really live um, and I know I was one of those guys as well. Before I had my back surgery in 2007, I had gotten very comfortable. I had, I'd been camping out in that comfort cave with my health habits, with my uh, chasing new goals. I was so focused on my kids. And I think that as, as guys, we need to have somebody come alongside of us and say, hey, let's go chase a new peak. And if you look at the, uh, I've been watching a lot of documentaries on climbing Mount Everest. You know what they call the distance between um, the last camp and the peak of Everest? No. It's called the death zone. 
the death. The death so. <clears throat> okay. Well, why do people get so excited for summoning Everest? Because they go through the death zone, which makes them, I mean, it's, again, not that you have to risk death in itself, but you have to risk extreme risk in their case. Death is the most extreme. But the idea of risking something makes you feel more alive. And, you know, as this, uh, Tim McGraw has a great uh, country song, you know, live like you were dying. And that idea of embracing things like, you know what, I only have a certain amount of months left. And not every one of us only has a certain number of months left. As I talked about in this idea of the dash is that we only have a certain number of months left. For some of us, it may be 72, some people it may be 120, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to a number of days and a number of months and maybe a few years when it's all said and done. And uh, we only have a little bit of time on the clock to go out there and, and truly live. And so that would be my challenge to those people that are watching or listening today is, what is it that will make you feel more alive? And maybe it is a calling. Maybe you have a, a mission or you have something in your life, a group of people that you'd like to serve. Um, and maybe the idea of success needs to shift towards how can I be successful and significant? How can I begin to make a difference in the world? How can I improve the lives of other people, which also leads to uh, the concept of being a leader, which is why I use that acronym is because People that are climbing mountains of extraordinary life, they're oftentimes leading other people up the mountain. They're leading their kids, they're leading their spouse, they're leading their friends, they're leading their clients, their customers, um, and oftentimes total strangers. They look at your life and they say, hey, the way that Kevin and Bryant live their life, I wanna live my life like them. And so it has this ripple effect that gets us all of the, out of the muck and the mire that we're in right now as a country and we start thinking about the idea of, all right, what's our next peak? Where are we going? Robert Schuler used to say, you get a peak, P-E-A-K, or P-E-E-K, at your next peak. <laughs> yeah. when, when you hit a new peak, you get a new peak at the next P-E-A-K. And so um, my question to everybody here is, is that do you have another peak, P-E-A-K, that you've looked at and seen and said, you know what, that's something I'd like to be, or that's something I'd like to do, or that's something I'd like to have, and if not, the book will help you to do that. Yeah, don't, I, I'd say this about, um, you know, inspiring others by the way you live and so on. Don't be, uh, you know, don't be looking for that, uh, that feedback necessarily, right? Because it's not, it's not always going to be there. There'll be lots of influences that you have in the lives of other people. And you can think about other people that have had influence in your life that have no idea, right? Um, and, and that's okay. Um, you know, that's, that's just the way that works. You don't necessarily get the feedback. Well, oftentimes they say that change, right? The innovation of change is at first it's ridiculed. No, dad, you're not going to do that. You're not going to, yeah. you're going to go climb a 14er in Colorado. Dad, come on. You're not in good shape for that. And then it's vehemently opposed, right? As soon as you commit to do it, at first it's a joke. When they see you training for it, they're like, dad, you're going to die up there. No, I don't want you to go. And then when you go through that and you go do it and you come back down, I mean, I don't know if it was just happenstance, but my 22 year old daughter ran a half marathon less than 12 months after I did. Outstanding. Why would she yeah, do that? I don't right. think you know, that's happenstance. Right. <laughs> no, I, that's I, love the, I love the quote that says, people do what people do, good and bad, right? Yeah. Random acts of kindness, people do what people do. If somebody pays for your coffee, I love that. I love the feeling. Like the other night, my wife and I were out at a restaurant and uh, we got to talking to these other this other couple that we had at the bar. It was just packed and uh, great conversation. And uh, I snuck away, went to the uh, restroom and paid for their deal. You know, just fun, you know, random act of kindness. They had no yep. clue, right? Yep. So I told the waitress, don't tell them, don't tell them who, who did it. And we got up and walked away. I had great conversation, laughed, I mean, total strangers and made an impact on their life it gives me the chills just thinking about it yeah having me walk away and this is something that kurt actually did kurt would um why he's such a good guy is that him and his family would sit around and they say hey, who can we bless today you know and they look for somebody and they say hey, let's do that family over there yeah and they yeah. buy the meal and walk away never tell them hey we just paid for your meal and tell the rest tell the waitress and have it be a total random act of kindness and have it be secret yep and i'm telling you the feeling you got i mean i think it cost me they had some drinks. It cost me like 50 or 60 bucks for a couple <laughs> of two. Um, but 
you can't buy that kind of happiness. You know, you can't buy 60 for 60 bucks to buy a smile. And, and there's a lot of studies out right now that the amount of laughter and smile. Now, the two of you giggle, giggle farts. You guys are having a good time. But the average <laughs> person has less laughter every year as they get older. So there's like a, a peak. And then from the age of about 25, it goes down. And then what happens is, is that it bounces at 80 and it goes back up. Okay. So, you know, how much laughter, how many smiles have you had recently? And could that be connected to how you've been choosing to live your life? Have you been reacting to life or have you been creating your life? We have been officially tagged as giggle farts. <laughs> giggle that, farts. That is a new one. <laughs> I that love is, that. I have not heard that one before. I, I, I accept that, man. I'm, I'm happy to be a giggle fart. For those of those people that are thinking that this is special effects, no, Kevin and Bryant are actually laughing and giggling at the entire time. Absolutely. <laughs> You're listening to this. I can see them. They're laughing. I am a, yeah, I am a better person because of not just the book, but this conversation. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. This, this is really fun. It's, um, it's remarkable, actually. Um, are you, by the way, watching all these documentaries on Mount Everest? Because that's, you know, your next extraordinary task are you are you heading there is that what we're picking up on so in terms of everest um there is a significant uh level of climbing skill that you need to pick up so right. my thing this year is uh, i'm going to climb a 14er in colorado so that's going to be that's uh about half of mount everest mount everest right. is 29,000 29 feet right um to the peak and so uh i'm going to do the a 14er is going to be my next challenge my what my daughter and i are going to do a what they call a sprint triathlon, which is kind of a modified version of the Ironman. It's a little bit less than, well, it's a lot less than an Ironman, but it's a, kind of a combination run, swim, bike uh, combo. And yeah. Uh, yeah, just choosing something hard to do each year that kind of pushes you outside your comfort zone. And uh, I got a few other things that I'm working on too that are um, not just physical challenges, you know, learning a different language and, you know, playing a musical instrument. Um, you know, being able to play in a rock band or something, I mean, not, not like a formal career, but just like, you know, if we're at a party and there's a rock band there and I go, Hey, can I play the drums for you? And they start playing like, what an experience that would be <laughs> like, right. if you haven't right. been a drummer your entire life. And I did that one time when I was in high school and it was one of the most amazing feelings. The drum or the guitarist kind of played around my ability to keep a beat, <laughs> but I never graduated <laughs> beyond that, you know? And I, you know, I had a couple of liquid beverages in me, so I was uh, having some fun doing it. But, um, you know, those are the things that I think really what life is made of is those experiences, right? It's not more stuff necessarily. While it nice, I mean, I got some really nice cars and a nice house, um, you know, experiences, you know, given experiences yeah. to yourself and to your kids, great gift. Yeah, yeah. Well, if people want to read more about you or get a hold of you or any of that, um, how can they do that? Yeah, the best way is just to go to the website, uh, theextraordinarylife.com. Um, we got a Facebook page as well on there. You can be a part of the community. You can download. We have a there's an, an accompanying planner that goes with the uh, the book, which is an eight and a half by eleven, and there's a ninety day ninety day challenge in there. So there's a page where you can go in there and you can start planning your extraordinary day, and uh, it's a little bit more of a uh, a journal, if you will, um, where people can start to write stuff down. The book has similar questions. It doesn't have the actual daily planner in there, but you can download a free version of that at the website, theextraordinarylife.com. And it's an editable PDF where you can fill it out on your own. Uh, this is my gift to you all, um, just for being a listener or watcher of the podcast. Um, go check it out and uh, give some feedback and uh, give credit uh, where credit is due. And that's to you guys for introducing them to it. So I really would love to give that gift to the to the listeners and the watchers of you guys' podcast because extraordinary things awesome. are going to happen awesome. in yeah. 2022. That's, that's yeah, amazing. We'll, we'll definitely put that link down there. Thank you very much for that. That's, that's outstanding. Yeah, and I, um, my probably concluding thought on, on all of this is we are really living in um, just uh, – very unusual, extraordinary. You can put any adjective you want it. Very different uh, sort of period of time than at least in my lifetime uh, our country has ever experienced. 
And every once in a while, you come across somebody who's just decided not to, to steal another quote, let the turkeys get them down, and they just keep going, and they just they're they're achieving, they're accomplishing, they're doing new and different things, many of which you've talked about examples of, you know, in the last five minutes. It's very refreshing, and uh, it just makes you. It's it's nice to be able to take your uh, you know your mind off of all the stuff that's everywhere and just say who am i where am i going and uh and it's a really good question that you asked and i wish you wouldn't have asked it because i'm going to dwell on it for days now <laughs> um are you more successful than you are significant that is a great question yeah, it is. and i would um i would encourage everybody who's listening to really sort of own that for a little bit in their own head and make sure that they are answering that question the way they want to and if not and then get this book and figure it out it's uh yeah it's good stuff really good stuff it's i'm good. glad we're re in, in touch again too this yeah is, no doubt yeah. man and you uh you're you're living it you uh i would definitely put you in the category as as an extraordinary human being and uh the things that you're doing for yourself and your own life and your family and and how you're sharing uh your your thoughts and and philosophies with other people uh outstanding thanks guys well I think the two of you guys are doing some extraordinary things as well. And we do this together. We inspire one another. We encourage each other. And, you know, I'll just wrap things up by saying, you know, I'm just an ordinary guy, you know, just choosing to do extraordinary things. And you don't have to be exceptional in life to do extraordinary things. You just have to go above and beyond what's usual, regular, and customary. So today you can decide to say, you know what, I'm going to start living my calling. I have no idea what that is but I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to go find out what my calling is. And I don't even know what I'm dreaming about. I never, you know, my family talked about dreaming a lot. So I realized that dreaming is not intuitive. You know, many people here watching or listening, they've never had anybody in their life call them to do something extraordinary. And today we did a call or did a podcast show on just that topic is that you've been called and it's up to you to decide to answer the call. You can put the pillow over your ears and, you know, block it all out. And you can not choose to engage in your dreams and live an ordinary life. And, you know, thankful that we live in America uh, because of the work that uh, so many other people did before us. We're standing on the shoulders of people that, uh, you know, did a whole lot more for us than we've ever done for fighting for our freedom. Um, and you'll live a really good life in America. You, you could live a really good ordinary life, but if you choose, which it is a choice. And even if you don't choose, you still made a choice. You can choose to live an extraordinary life. And I really appreciate you guys for all the work that you're doing with the podcast and just for the work that you guys do as men uh, in our country. Thanks for being leaders, guys. I think that you guys are extraordinary. Bet. Thank you. And my, my takeaway quote from, uh, from this past hour, however long we've been going, is, uh, is, is what you just said. And I, I love that. I'm going to own this one too. I'm just an ordinary guy who's made the choice to do extraordinary, extraordinary things. things. And you know what's nice about that? Because everybody can say that. They're, they're, not, they're not anything other than ordinary. But you can choose to be extraordinary. That's, that's powerful right there. I love it. I love it. Yes, indeed. It just makes you smile, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. It does. Very cool. All right. I think it's time. It's time? Yes. It's time for me to reach over here and hit this button? Yes, it is. <laughs> and say something like this. No matter who you are, where you are, what you're doing, make sure that you're living an extraordinary life. And between this podcast and the next, you take time to, to enjoy, enjoy the ride. ride. Thank you, David. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Great Bay Chronicles. Please subscribe so you'll receive notification when new episodes are available. To learn more about the Greybeards, visit their website, graybeardchronicles.com. I'm going to go find that chick. <laughs> I heard you're sleeping with her. Oh, the word's out. <laughs>